everyone, and welcome to Untamed Unfiltered. I'm Amanda Nicholson. And I'm Aaron Provencio, and today we are going to talk about episode two of season two of Untamed, which is Wild Neighbors. And today we are joined by Maggie McCartney and Caroline Helpers. How are we doing today? Great. Good. Having us. Well, thank you guys for joining us today. Uh, for those of you who didn't watch last week's episode, uh, this is our post-untamed chat, just a chance for us to get to talk a little bit more with people in the episode, people involved with each episode, and just, you know, a, a time to get a little bit deeper into some of our topics in Untamed. As I mentioned before, Today, we are going to be talking about episode two um, of Untamed season two, which is Wild Neighbors. And that's the reason why we have you two here today, is because you were both instrumental in the formation of this episode. You kind of want to go into telling us about how that process looked? Yeah, so there's a couple of different pro approaches that we took when planning this episode. The first was kind of an anecdotal approach. What are the things that we encountered the most at the front desk? What are the stories that we hear and the questions that we hear the most? And kind of what are the messages that we communicate most often um, to share in the episode? But then also we have statistical information too that helps us decide what is the most important and what are the most common challenges that people face. So statistics from our phone call records and from our patient intake can really help us decide what are the most important and most common conflicts people are encountering. So after looking at the data, we also took a look at who we wanted in the episode. So Maggie really likes snakes and making sure people understand that snakes aren't necessarily bad if they're in your yard. So she took a approach to snakes and then Marley in the episode wanted to highlight mammals that may be nuisances in people's yards. Yeah, I think it was especially fun for us to build an episode that's kind of focused around what we do every day. Um, we're all really heavily involved in the day-to-day -day conversations with the public about the wildlife that they're encountering in their yards and in local parks and on their do dog walks and things like that. And so the opportunity for us to take that single conversation that we might have with one person 20 times a day and be able to have that conversation with a wider audience um, was really exciting. So we each kind of instantly latched on to those things that we're particularly interested in that we really wanted to talk about. For me, that's snakes. Um, but different people have different favorites. So it really worked out for everybody to kind of have their chunk. So you kind of mentioned it before. And in the episode, you say something along the lines of just by just because an animal is in your property, in your neighborhood, in your yard, doesn't necessarily make them a nuisance. Now, what did you mean by that? That's a really important point that we'd like to remind people when they call about nuisance wildlife. Uh, just because they see a fox or raccoon in an urban environment doesn't mean it shouldn't be there. This was their habitat before we moved in and they're just following their instincts where they know to find food. So if you see a fox or raccoon out in your, your yard during the day, especially with babies, they're just doing what they know they have to do to raise those young. Yeah, oftentimes what we're doing when people call the center with nuisance wildlife is coaching tolerance and helping people to understand these animals better so that they can learn to either share space or use humane deterrence or control attractants to help mitigate wildlife conflict rather than jumping straight to removal or relocation of what are initially perceived as nuisance animals. Yeah. And one of the things that I loved in watching this episode back, I mean, we, we knew this was going to be called Wild Neighbors, uh, right? These are the animals that live around us. And I thought it was so great in the beginning, Ed mentioned basically just like any neighborhood, you have to get to know your neighbors. So you get to know the comings and goings and their habits. And I just... I don't know, like that's very basic, but I never really thought about it that way. But that's right, right? Like in my neighborhood, I know my human neighbors and like who comes and goes and what's normal and what's abnormal for them. So we can kind of extrapolate that to our, our wild neighborhood as well. And you really just kind of have to, to get to know them and get to know what, um, what their habits are. That's right, Amanda. If you want to be a good neighbor to humans, you need to know what's normal for them and what's going on in their lives. Same thing for those wild neighbors. You need to know what are normal patterns and behaviors for those wildlife species and understand what you can do to create a safe habitat for both you and them to coexist. 
these animals don't know that they're in a human habitat. They're just doing their best to survive. So they are attracted to the resources that are easy to access. And we are a large source of those resources. Uh, by relating a human wildlife conflict to the animal's natural history, we can find solutions to the conflict for a peaceful resolution that fully addresses the source of the problem and not removing the individual animal. Just like in a human neighborhood too, you can't pick and choose just your favorite neighbors. So if you decide you want to make a habitat that's inviting for wildlife, you're inviting the whole ecosystem into that space. You can't put up a bird feeder and expect not to have songbird predators show up as well. So um, that's another way that I think it certainly lines up with uh, most neighborhoods that I've lived in too. And Carolyn, I think it's kind of interesting what you mentioned earlier that you said, you know, wildlife and animals have been in this area for a lot longer than we have. You know, the habitats that, that we are moving into as humans and beginning to develop already had existing ecosystems. And so it's not necessarily strange to see the animals the wildlife that we might have displaced showing back up again. Yeah, they've adapted really well to living in urban and suburban environments. Uh, they've always been here and they're just adapting to life with us. They're doing a great job, so we need to step up and do our part as well. I always think it's really interesting um, to hear people describe wildlife in urban and suburban areas as invaders, as if they are coming in from the outside to an established, you know, existing situation that didn't have them, when in reality, we've kind of plopped ourselves into their existing community. So kind of reflecting on that and keeping that in mind when confronted with any kind of human wildlife conflict or or struggle with how to coexist with wildlife is very important because they truly were here first and we have a duty to protect and conserve them and make sure that our immediate environment isn't presenting hazards or unsafe attractants for them. So in your role at the Wildlife Center, I'm sure you guys get asked this question all the time, but what are some unique or interesting calls that you've received about nuisance wildlife? One of my favorite stories that kind of relates to backyard neighbors and being a good neighbor to wildlife, um, of course, involves snakes because it's me. I can't, I can't help myself. Um, but late last summer, we got a call when I was working at the front desk at about 4.30 in the afternoon from a woman who had found three black racers all entangled in the same piece of landscape netting that's used to control erosion. And she called and she was very distressed about these three snakes. Um, she could tell they were still alive, but they were in really, really poor shape. Um, and since it was towards the end of the workday and I was headed that way anyway, I don't normally do this, but I decided to swing by and pick those snakes up myself that day. Um, and the conversation that I had with that woman in her yard while I was rescuing those snakes and then also afterwards following up really changed her perspective about the way that she's using and monitoring those materials and her first reaction was, I'm, I'm never touching anything like that ever again. Get it out of my yard. I don't want to see it. If I see it somewhere else, I'm going to pull it all up. And that's great. It's great to have that kind of turnaround. Um, and I think it's also fair to, to make smaller adjustments and kind of, you know, if you need to use materials like that, make sure you're checking them really regularly and that kind of thing. But I loved how enthusiastically she came to the defense of these animals, um, recognized the impacts of what was going on in her immediate space around her house and wanted to make really swift and dramatic changes to try to protect those animals. Yeah, and another thing to know, especially this time of year since it's spring, so it's right in the front of my mind, is a lot of the conflicts that we come across with animals in our backyard are them raising their babies and finding dens and nests to uh, you know, have their young and make sure it's a safe spot and our houses can be a really great spot for them. Uh, a really common call I get is uh, songbird nests in people's dryer vents. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that that's a really attractive spot for those birds. It's nice and warm, it's protected. If you don't have a screen covering it, it's really easy for them to get in. And uh, one specific call, actually a person realized there's a nest in their dryer vent because they found a bird in their dryer. Uh, it wasn't a protected line and they opened up their dryer one day and there was an adult bird. Uh, so a really easy way to work with the animals and make sure they're still able to do their part and raise their young. What I recommend to people, gently pull that nest out uh, and then take an Easter basket or something similar and just hang it up next to the vent and then the birds can continue to feed their babies because we don't want to bring them into rehab if there's no point. Uh, so it's a really great way to work with people and just remind them, you know, 
you're providing an attractive habitat, but here's a way that you guys can coexist peacefully. Uh, just two days ago, actually, I got a call of uh, this couple that was removing a dead tree in their yard and a little screech owl baby popped out um, and they were, they were concerned. Uh, so I walked them to, through how to re-nest him, find a hole in the tree, pop him back in, make sure there's another baby there. There's evidence that there was a nest. Uh, and they did that. And the next day that they successfully re-nested that owl. And since we currently had a baby screech owl uh, in our possession that couldn't be re-nested, they actually were able to foster that owl onto that tree. And they were so excited about having baby owls in their yard. They said, we'll wait a month or two to cut down this tree. It's fine, we're not in any rush. So it's really great to have those stories where, um, you know, their plans were derailed a little bit, but they're willing just to make some minor adjustments and, you know, let wildlife have their moment to raise their babies. Yeah, I, I think it's really great how you can really change someone's perspective just through a, a simple conversation. And I find that these, the calls that we would put into the category of being about wild neighbors really fall into a couple of different categories. One is this animal is here and it's doing something I don't like and I don't want it here. And we're having to try to help work through that with somebody. But then there's also these situations like what Caroline is describing where the fact that these animals happen to be in someone's backyard um, it may have gotten them into some trouble or it may just be the circumstance that allows someone to notice that they were in trouble. So it's not just about thinking about our habitat, it's also about kind of keeping an eye on those wild neighbors and recognizing when they may actually be in need of, of human intervention, whether it's a result of our actions or not. Speaking about that category of wild neighbors that maybe are doing things that inconvenience us or things that we don't like, uh, one of the other subjects that that I really wanted us to get into this episode, and when we sat down to kind of put everything together, we talked a lot about this, um, was the whole subject of trapping and relocating, um, which, man, like I, I get it from the perspective of a homeowner who's just like, oh, they're doing this thing, they're getting in my trash, they're in, you know, they're causing an issue, and isn't it easier just to trap them and put them someplace else? And then they go away, my problem's solved, and the animal gets to go live its life. They don't want to kill it. You know, it seems like it's a nice little easy solution, but we know that's not the case, right? It's definitely not the case. I would say 80% of the calls I get from people who have a problem with wildlife in the yard just want to relocate it. Um, and I always tell them, in almost every single circumstance, it's not the best solution. Um, just removing one individual from your yard, it may be a short-term solution and the best option for you, but it's not the best option for everyone in, in the situation. You know, you're moving that animal from its home. They know where to find resources, where to find food and water and shelter. If you take that animal out of their home habitat and put them into another habitat, they have no idea where to find those resources. And in most cases, there's a ton of studies that show this, they don't survive and they don't do well. Uh, and another thing to remember is that you may remove that one animal, but it's a proven habitat that works well for that species. So someone else is just gonna come right in. And so you really need to take care of why that animal is coming in and why it's causing a disturbance for you and figure out a way to make it work for everyone. Just, I mean, just imagine if you were a wild animal, you were living your life, you didn't know you were doing anything wrong, suddenly someone snatches you up out of your home and they place you in this new environment, uh, you, you know, don't know where to find anything. And we're also concerned about already established territories. There's a lot of animals that have established territories and if another individual comes into that, they're going to fight and that poor animal that was moved to a new location can't defend itself properly because they haven't had nutrients in that area. And then we're also concerned about disease transfer. These populations are getting more and more segregated now that we're moving and cutting off their habitats. And so these populations have established, um, you know, diseases that they're immune to, and then they may move that animal and then you free, you know, disease pockets, especially right now with everything that's going on, we really need to you know, be cognizant of wildlife and their health and how it helps and pertains to humans. 
And, and this relocation issue exists on a broad range of scales. I mean, we're, we're talking about everything from a black bear that people want to relocate, you know, to the other side of the state to get it so that it can't come back versus something like a turtle or a snake that if you relocate them even a, a mile or two down the road, it could cause a, a pretty significant disturbance to their survival. So depending on the species, there's some even more specific and even more concerning um, considerations as far as relocation, especially with reptiles. And I'll just keep talking about reptiles here, but, but it's true with, with snakes, they've actually done quite a bit of telemetry work where they've demonstrated that these relocated animals spend way too much time moving around their habitats, which is a good indication that they don't know how to use the habitat efficiently because they haven't lived there. So rather than saying, hey, I'm going to go right here when I need to get warm, and I'm going to go right here for water, and when I'm too warm, I'm going to go under this rock, they've got to figure all that stuff out again. And resetting all of that distracts them from finding food and other things, and, and it's just really, it's a struggle, and they, they do tend to not survive in a lot of cases, unfortunately. Yeah. So you, you seem to have a, a, a warrior cause for snakes and, and scaly creatures out there, and, and sometimes people are more comfortable with their feathered or furry backyard neighbors, but you want to you put a plug in for the reptiles? Well, in case I haven't already enough, um, one of the really great things about advocating for snakes, um, and this is true for, for many of our wild neighbors, and, and many of my friends can advocate for, for other animal groups, but there are so many things that you can point to that are beneficial about having snakes around. So it's if I'm speaking to someone about snakes and they have a degree of intolerance or misunderstanding, through the conversation, I can usually figure out what about that person's lifestyle I can point to to show them why snakes are helpful. If it's a farmer, we can talk about the control of rodents. You know, if it's somebody who has a garden, we can talk about the fact that they love to eat squirrels. So there's all kinds of different things that we can kind of um, can kind of pull on people's heartstrings in the right way to help connect them to to wild animals. Um, and I know it's really hard for some people to connect, especially with predator animals because they like to watch um, the little ones in their yards, you know, the ones that we think about attracting to our backyards are little songbirds and chipmunks and things like that. And so when the big hawk comes along to have a, a songbird snack or the snake gets into the nest of eggs that you've been watching on your porch for weeks, that can be really devastating for people and really upsetting. And so these predatory animals already have to kind of fight that villainous uh, perspective that that people sometimes have just because eating other animals is part of their lifestyle. Um, but that that's part of why they're so useful and so important for the ecosystem. And it's easy for, for me to point to many different things about snakes to try to help people connect with them and find that, that way to help someone want to tolerate them a little bit more. That's such a good, um, a good way to put it of like your warrior cause or your warrior species and um yes for sure we're we know at the center like maggie and snakes and you know anything to do with snakes um i'm curious caroline if you had to pick like one species to be a warrior your warrior cause what would it be that's really hard. I, I would say probably our raptors. I get quite a number of calls of people who enjoy the baby cottontails in their yard and their songbirds and then a red-tailed hawk comes in and picks up one of those guys for dinner and I can understand how it can be upsetting but that hawk is just trying to survive. It needs dinner as well and you have to remember predators are part of a larger ecosystem that helps keep everything in balance and you you can't have the songbirds without the predators. You can't you know have them with without the hawks and falcons coming in and they're beautiful in their own right and they're majestic creatures as well and you know, just you should take advantage of watching the entire process that's happening in front of you. With Without those guys, then those songbird populations would become too big. They'd fight for resources or you'd have outbreaks within the population. They serve their purpose. And it's really important to remember that you, you can't choose which animals you keep in your backyard. It's all part of a bigger picture. Yeah. What about you, Erin? I know you're not on the front lines of, you know, taking calls and stuff, but still, like, we all have our own little things, right? Yeah, um, I mean, I'm always interested, primarily studying ecology concepts in college. 
I'm always interested in fighting for the little guys, you know, the ones that don't get the credit. So your bugs, your arachnids, your isopods, your insects, the kind of things that if you lift up a rock, you'll find centipedes, roly polies, a couple of earthworms, maybe some ants. I mean, the fact of the matter is that those, the highly complex ecosystems that aren't only in the forest, but are also in your backyards, rely on everything from the black bears all the way down to the little tiny, you know, mites that live in the soil because it's those, it's those things that help break down nutrients and return that energy to the ecosystem through the soil that end up running the entire thing. And so, so often people will see a, a spider or a centipede or a cricket and think like, yeah, I don't know, I don't need to worry about that or even go as far as squishing it. And, and I think personally, if you love the songbirds and you love the big mammals and you love the small mammals and whatever else it is, you got to give a little credit to the bugs out there. And Aaron brings up such a good point too, because it's the, it really is this whole intricate ecosystem that, you know, even if you were to just dig up like a square foot of soil in your backyard, you would find hundreds of different organisms there. And it brings up the, the idea of the kind of things that we can do and not do to help make sure that the habitat that we control in our own yards and properties is safe for wildlife and avoiding the use of like chemicals and things like that that are gonna affect all those little fragile organisms that are the basis for everything else that exists. And of course we can talk a lot about um, sort of making a wildlife friendly yard with the way that you plant plants and garden and that kind of thing. But the less that we can destroy and the less that we can alter from what happens naturally in the world, the more those organisms are gonna be able to exist in that appropriate balance. Um, and I think that that's a really, a really neat and fascinating thing that you can dive into so much, learning so much about like gardening for wildlife um, and it's such a neat hobby. Um, so we could really get down a rabbit hole with that, but I think it's important to recognize that that whole ecosystem really depends on itself and each other. What about you, Amanda? What's your warrior cause? Oh man, um, I don't know if I have a, singular warrior cause, but I do, I do enjoy like the bears and, and that aspect. And it's something that I know we get a lot of calls at, at the center. It's not an easy solution either. Um, Cause you know, bears are big. <laughs> they're causing a lot of issues typically if they're causing issues. But um, I actually had had an experience of a bear in my neighborhood last fall, like at the end of the fall, beginning of the winter, um, which was interesting for me here. I live in a little suburban neighborhood in Waynesboro. Um, we had not experienced that before, but we had a bear uh, hitting bird feeders and trash cans. So it was interesting to kind of go through it from the homeowner's perspective um, and chat with the neighbors and, you know, try and get people on board with like keeping your trash locked up until the morning that trash gets picked up, taking down those feeders. Um, actually, I took a little brief snippet because, you know, part of my job for Untamed is just thinking through everything and getting some B-roll. So there's a little brief uh, snippet of B-roll of my alley that was hit up by this bear, uh, I think in this episode, and it made it into the trailer for season two as well. Because um, it was, you know, one morning after that bear hit, I was like, oh, I'm just going to go get some footage of all this. But um, I was the crazy person in the neighborhood who uh, my dogs would hear the bear at like 2 a.m. And so we would come flying out the back door with like pots and pans and lights and start yelling to try and scare the bear off. Um, so I'm like, man, I gotta, I gotta train this bear that this is sadly not a friendly neighborhood, right? That is not behavior we want. Um, but I actually remember that, Amanda, last fall, I got a lot of calls from multiple of your neighbors about that bear coming into the neighborhood, and a lot of them weren't tolerant of the bear, and so I had to take a moment and remind them that, you know, this bear is attracted to your trash or your bird feeder or your grill, and so you have to do your part. Um, I distinctly remember this one story of um, a woman who kept her trash in her screened-in porch and thought that was enough, and the bear tore off the, her screened-in porch door, and I had to, you know, do gentle reminder that you have to be a little bit, um, 
you know, think a little bit more and about how you can contain that trash. You need to think about a bear, you know, a 200 pound bear is easily going to be able to get through a, a screen. You have to lock up those trash cans and, and make sure he won't be able to come back. Yeah. And I think Jamie, Jamie Sajaki is in this episode of Untamed and she does such a nice job. And she, uh, in the past, when she talks about bears, I love that she really tries to um, make people empathize with them a little bit of like, hey, these bears are not like, let me try and find a way to make your life miserable and ruin your bird feeder and take your trash. But, you know, bears are all about eating, much like many of us, right? That is a very relatable thing uh, sometimes of like, I just want to eat more food. Um, and bears are so big and they require so many calories. So like, yes, we as humans and bears as well, we have those days where we're like, okay, I gotta like deal with all this food that I got to put in my body for the day. And some days you, whatever, you get ingredients and you take the time and you prep yourself a nice meal. Like the bears are out there foraging with acorns and berries and all of the different things. But some days we're all lazy and we just want to like get a pizza and have it delivered to our house. And bears just want to go hit up the trash can in the alley because they can get all of those calories, right? So we all have our lazy moments. And I love that Jamie takes that of like, you know, we all have those times. Um, it's very relatable uh, having that sort of um, intent. So I'm glad she was in this episode. And she also had such a great line too, because I know that people really reach for wanting to trap and relocate bears because they're so big. Um, but she had a great quote in there and I actually wrote it down because I loved it so much that just, it's not a question of if can bears be trapped and relocated? That's not quite the right question. Of course we can do it, but what problem would that solve or why would we be doing it? So, and that's always a little bit harder to solve, or it just takes more time to solve. But I think that ultimately is our more effective solution, whether it's bears or other species of wildlife too. And I know with bears, is it's especially difficult because they're so big and people are scared of them. I mean, if you think about it, you have a bird feeder, a squirrel's going to go after that bird seed too, but you're more tolerant of it because they're cute little squirrels. They're not causing a big problem, but a bear is doing the, essentially the same thing. And then that causes a bigger problem because, you know, they are larger, um, you know, you're afraid of them. And it's really important to remember, you know, they're just doing what bears do. They're looking for food. And so we, we have to think about the underlying problem and why they're doing this and what we can do to help coexist with them. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, it comes down to compassion and empathy and like trying to view the situation from the perspective of the animal and from the perspective of your neighbors and everyone else who might be involved in the situation and trying to really understand where that, why that animal is there, where they're coming from, what they're there for, and truly trying to approach the situation through their eyes is, is the best way to find a solution for most of these challenges that people encounter with wildlife conflict. So it's up to us to find a humane so solution. The animals are just going to keep doing what they, you know, need to do. And it's up to us to, you know, figure out a way to make it work for everyone. Yeah. And so, Maggie, you kind of talked about this earlier with the backyard habitats. And we'll actually be talking about this a little bit later in the season. Um, but what, as, as neighbors, right, we live in a neighborhood, we want to be compassionate, like you were saying, to our neighbors. So sometimes you'll, you know, bring, bring in somebody's newspaper or shovel the driveway. Now with our wild neighbors, what are some ways that we can be better neighbors to those that live in our neighborhoods? Now that's a good question. I think um, there's two important categories, avoiding things that are dangerous and providing things that are helpful. Um, and I think in providing things that are helpful, you need to make sure that that also doesn't become dangerous for animals. But the most common hazards that we see coming from people's backyards and those kinds of habitats are pest control things like blue traps and netting that are, um, you know, catching lots of unintended animals. And that can be a, a big problem and, and cause a lot of pain for those animals. So we do admit a lot of animals under those circumstances. Um, but then I also think just, just coaching that tolerance is really, really important too. For other, for other types of situations. 
it, yeah, it, it's good. Just remember to have a little bit of patience. If your neighbor is sick or in the hospital and their lawn isn't mowed, you know, as short as you would like, you're not going to become upset with them. You're just going to give them time and you're going to be patient. It's the same thing for wild animals. You know, they, you can't expect things to happen overnight and you, you have to work with them. I think it's also important too to realize that a lot of people enjoy to be able to live sort of at one and in touch with nature. If you like to have trees and bushes and be really close to the woods in the back of your house, or you, you like to have a very naturalistic looking backyard or front yard, animals see that and they, they think it looks good too, you know? So I think it's important to, like you're saying, to have that compassion and patience and realize that if you want to have, to be in touch with nature and sort of have that type of, of lifestyle, you have to be okay with an occasional guest or two. Yes. And I also think it's important to remember that if, if you're going to insert yourself into that kind of system and start manipulating habitat, with that comes some responsibility too. Um, for example, we see um, certain diseases in songbirds that are transmitted at bird feeders because they're sites where lots of songbirds are concentrated and interacting more than they would when seed is spread throughout their habitat as it would be naturally. So if we're doing that, it's our responsibility to make sure those feeders are clean and disinfected and safe. So it's not just about giving them things, it's also about making sure that, that that's safe for them. Yeah, overall, I think that, um, I mean, that's just emphasizes that we are all connected, right? Our habitat, the wild neighborhood, um, and basically all what we do, Jamie Sajeki had another great quote in there too, basically, of like what you do really matters to this situation. Like in effect, your behavior is a part of this equation too and, and plays into how we all work together, how we all live together. Yeah, and there is definitely a One Health tie-in with this backyard neighbor kind of um, concept because there are those wildlife diseases that if we're not appropriately controlling the way that wildlife is interacting with our space can cause a hazard for human and pet health. Um, like if we have wild animals sharing food and water bowls with outdoor cats or things like that, um, those can present some serious One Health type issues too. So it, it really truly does connect to everything we talk about, um, that One Health concept. Well, I think that probably wraps up another Untamed Unfiltered. So thank you guys. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, Caroline, for joining us this week. And this has been Untamed Unfiltered, and we'll see you next week. Bye, everybody.